ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the uh, afternoon and final uh, series of events at the Creative Citizens Conference. Now, um, for the next hour, you've got um, myself and uh, John Hartley. Uh, one of the things uh, that has uh, stuck in my memory that's been said, uh, it's been said in different ways by a few people in workshops that I've been in. It was said this morning by uh, Steve Swindells. Is Steve here? Uh, yeah, there he is. Uh, uh, he said, we may be academics, but we're also <coughs> citizens. Uh, and uh, that encouraged me to think that what we're about to do is not quite so stupid as, you know, at periodic times in the last you know, week or three, I've thought, oh my goodness, it might be really stupid to do this. Um, but uh, what we, uh, John and I, thought that we would do, rather than um, uh, giving a lecture uh, about um, what we think the future of creative citizenship is, or indeed its history or its present, uh, we thought that we would try to explain uh, how come we landed on the creative citizen space on the game board uh, and how come we landed there at the same time and how come when we landed there we found this was such a rich conversation. And like most things in life, you can explain it uh, as a set of intellectual engagements uh, uh, but it's always the case uh, that there will be some biographical facts uh, that will illuminate the intellectual journey. So we decided, uh, at the risk of looking like complete prats, uh, and as if uh, for some reason we expect you all to be interested in you know, where we were born and things like that, we decided we were going to take the chance of doing this. John is even more nervous than I am. He's struck dumb currently. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, very rare condition. <laughs> very rare condition. Uh, and, uh, you know, in general, you know, this is... I am uh, the journalist uh, who uh, turned into a kind of uh, fake academic or para-academic. And John is, uh, you know... The academic... How many citations have you got on Google Scholar? 19,000. Yeah, 19,000! 19,000 <laughs> citations. How many citations have I got on Google Scholar? Seven. Seven? <laughs> 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 Isn't that bad? I thought it was 17 or 27. Or <laughs> have a check. Uh, it's not good. It's not a good number. Um, so, anyway, so what we're going to try and do is we're going to uh, show you some pictures and talk to them uh, to tell you the story of, you know, how we ran into each other and what happened then and how we kind of got to here. And hopefully uh, we'll only be less than halfway through our time by then. And then we can try and talk, uh, have a conversation about, you know, what you really came to uh, the RCA these two days to do, which is to uh, talk about what creative citizenship is and what it might be. So, let's go. He's the clicker. Before we get to the Pratt part, uh, uh, which is coming shortly. Uh, I just want to add my voice to the, uh, as it were, the self-justification for what we're about to do, which is to try and combine anecdote, narrative, storytelling with abstract thinking, conceptualization, and the, the advance of knowledge. So you be the judges, whether we make it or not, but that's what's lying behind this. Okay, yeah, so times, yeah, no, no, uh, uh, no. Now, who can this be? Who can this be? Uh, aren't I sweet? This is me dressed up as a television set. <laughs> That's the Vorin Hall holiday camp in North Wales. And standing behind me is my big brother, the Sheikh, and my middling brother, the Pirate. That's how I got into media. Uh, this is my childhood in the 1950s. Uh, it was uh, tragedy done as comedy, uh, a genre at which uh, the survivors of British boarding schools are very good. Uh, one of those survivors is up the top there, that's Eric Idle. Yeah, I don't know if you remember him, but he's the one out of the Monty Python group that makes money. Uh, and uh, down the bottom, that is me. Uh, this is the Royal Wolverhampton Orphan Asylum, you can see it there. Founded in 1850 uh, after a cholera epidemic. 
and uh, I spent five years there. So uh, the question for us both was how to get out of the predicament that we found ourselves in <laughs> in our childhoods. Yeah, so, yeah, exit velocity. Well, yeah, I didn't mention, I grew up in Burnley in Lancashire. That's where I spent my childhood. So now we move on, John, don't we? Uh, we, we, we have moved on, this is it. You want to go even faster? Yeah, yeah, no, I think <laughs> we <we're laughs> You know, that's it, that's our childhood. Uh, you know, dress up as a television, then go into teenage. Right. Oh, oh this is me. Uh, this is me as a teenager. This is uh, my brother, my middling brother, the pirate one, comes home from Dundee University one summer with this album. Now, this album, uh, probably not very recognisable to most of you, is The Hangman's Beautiful Daughter by the Incredible String Band. And you can see, you know, well, the picture you know, kind of tells you its appeal. Um, uh, and... The, you know, these were people who were rule breakers. Uh, they had tracks on their albums that were 17 minutes long, and they also had one that was, I think, 13 seconds long. Let me tell you what it said. It said, "Many are the lifetime. Many were the lifetimes of the son of Noah's brother. See his coat, the ragged riches of the soul." End. <laughs> uh, uh, my teenage years uh, need to be passed over in silence, and so I move on to when I was a student, which is much the same thing, arrested development and um, uh, uh, lots of time to dispose of. Uh, but the reason why these two pictures are up is that I was my, my external self, as it were, was formed by that year of um, things being broken, 1968, uh, uh, where one of the signal events of that year was the Grosvenor Square demonstration uh, against the Vietnam War, and you can see my proxy uh, uh, walking along in that uh, um, demonstration. My hair was slightly shorter than his. Uh, that is, of course, Mick Jagger. And then on the other side, the first demonstration that I went to as a student journalist. So I took lots of photographs of um, hairy people uh, protesting against uh, Maggie Thatcher, the milk thatch uh, snatcher, and uh, these were then published in the student magazine at Cardiff University, where I was a student. So my uh, f teenage formation, as it were, into seeing alternative universes uh, uh, took place in squares. Okay, so moving on, John. Then, uh, yeah, so, uh, I mean, I also went to university. I went to university uh, the year that John was getting it off with Mick Jagger in Trafalgar Square. <laughs> Uh, Grosvenor Square, Grosvenor Square, was it Grosvenor Square? Grosvenor Square, Grosvenor Square, yeah. Square. Trafalgar yeah, yeah. Square is this one. Yeah, yeah, but you can see that, you know, uh, I was not really, you know, with the placards. I was with the dogs uh, and the hair and the clothing of a, you know, particular kind. This guy, by the way, lives in Cardiff, did you know that? <coughs> um, Robin Williamson lives in Poncana. Um, and... Um, uh, but it raised the question, it was definitely a time when uh, you asked yourself that question. You know, what did being radical mean? Being radical to me I th didn't mean uh, going on big marches where I felt I was being bossed about by somebody with a loud hailer. For me, it was all, it was much more kind of community. I mean, I was interested, I was actually a little bit religious uh, and I was also interested in anarchism. Uh, so I was more interested in a kind of anarcho-communitarianism than I was a kind of Maggie, 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 out, out, out kind of politics. Not that I particularly wanted her to be in. <laughs> uh, whereas, I guess I should say that what I felt most strongly in, uh, on occasions like this was uh, uh, the sense of community with the people uh, among whom one walks on such occasions. Uh, something that stayed with me uh, ever since then. And, you know, it's a very variable experience. I think my, uh, my the most um, uh, challenging one was uh, when Henry Kissinger uh, visited Cardiff uh, for some summit or other, and they flew in one of those bulletproof cars. And, you know, you had a, a very strong sense of what the state could lay on if it needed to protect one of its own uh, in your home city. So there is a sense of community and community being disrupted by forces against which you want to take some kind of a stand. But at the same time, the mediation of this, I was very interested in finding ways to represent uh, public events, even at that tender age, by means other than traditional journalism or um, just the act itself. And so that's why I've set up there uh, that combining creative creativity and citizenship via media 
has been uh, a kind of an, uh, an abiding theme of uh, where I've been coming from. Yeah, so, uh, 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 yeah, okay, so, so I was, you know, so in a way egregiously into dogs, dirt, hair, um, and stuff like that, that uh, I got to the end of university and um, visited uh, the careers office. So I can't have been totally into dogs, dirt, and all that. Um, and uh, uh, I managed to get myself a job um, uh, on one of the journalism entry courses with one of the newspaper companies. <coughs> uh, and uh, then I met uh, the man who wrote this book, Eric Blakeborough, who uh, my father-in-law, uh, and uh, he was uh, um, uh, operating a kind of commune uh, in South London, uh, which turned into uh, uh, a kind of, well, as it says there in slightly garish language, a mission to London's drug scene. And to the despair of my wonderful and long-suffering parents, I chucked in the job in journalism uh, and went to the commune. Oh, and then, uh, why is that there? Uh, the, that, that's, uh, that's just a kind of link to Jeff Mulgan in a way. Uh, this is, I mean, this is, we've got dates on here somewhere. I'm hopeless on remembering dates. 1980 uh, and yeah, 98. Okay. Yeah, this is, so this is, this is you know, uh, later, later, later. By this time, because I do, you know, I, I get fed up of the commune and the hair, and, uh, and I actually go into journalism quite seriously and work in local papers, and then I get a job a job on the Financial Times, <laughs> <laughs> where the, there are no dogs or hair. Uh, uh, but uh, whilst I'm doing that kind of, um, you know, building my journalism career thing, I'm perpetually distracted by other ideas, uh, of which the formation of this think tank, Demos, uh, is, uh, is an important example. Uh, Jeff Mulgan uh, ran the think tank when it was created, uh, just before... Uh, the uh, emergence of Blair, the Prime Minister. Uh, and uh, I not only co-edited this book, uh, uh, I uh, wrote a chapter in it called A Step Beyond Morris Dancing, the Third Sector Revival. Uh, and uh, I remember writing that because some economist, actually somebody else who wrote for the FT uh, later, um, uh, had dismissed the whole kind of citizenship, community, voluntary agenda as being a load of Morris dancing. Uh, and uh, so I, I got my, I was getting interested in, on the side, you know, the argument being made at a political level about, uh, certainly it was thought of at that time in the early Blair years, the pre-Blair years and the Blair period, uh, as uh, you know, Amitai Etzioni, communitarianism, uh, that, was the, that was the thing. John. Um, this is really he here to um, confound the idea that the journalist is over there and the academic is over here. <coughs> uh, because I founded a newspaper in 1972 which is still running. It's called Guy Reeve. It's the student newspaper of Cardiff, uh, Cardiff University. And uh, I was very uh, richly involved in student journalism, which of course, as you know, doesn't count in relation to journalism as a profession. So my, uh, my uh, interaction with journalism uh, is very much to, uh, uh, to practice it on the margins where it doesn't count. Uh, this is, of course, in preparation for being an academic. And, um, uh, and to, 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 as it were, use the student community as a kind of avant-garde playground uh, to try new ideas about both journalism and its representation. And that stayed with me from that time to this. Uh, I was also involved, although not in a, uh, in a senior way, in a, ma in a magazine called Rebecca, named after the Rebecca riots of the 19th century, uh, very famous episodes in, in um, Wales. And Rebecca magazine made a name for itself by exposing local government corruption in the 1970s in South Wales, put about 12 people in jail, and, uh, and, and was uh, highly sought after by members of the public who couldn't buy it at WH Smith because they wouldn't stock it. And so we went out street selling on a Saturday um, <coughs> where we sold many more copies than the Morning Star next door. So uh, th that was a, 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 an exercise in uh, trying to understand how journalism can relate to a community uh, without going through mainstream institutions. But I didn't follow that path professionally. I followed it into analysis. And my first solo book, published in 1982, is called Understanding News and has at least one chapter 
describing uh, things that um, uh, you can find out using journalism uh, that if you follow the Rebecca rather than the um, mainstream press uh, perspective. What for one example, something that I think has now been proven sociologically by a very expensive three-year project with lots of ESRC money, is that magistrates don't live in the same um, suburbs as the people that they condemn. And uh, we, we, uh, we dealt with that problem uh, in 1973, I think, in Rebecca, simply by, pr by printing a map of Cardiff with the dots where the addresses of the magistrates were and the dots where the addresses of the uh, perpetrators, as it were, were. And, uh, you know, it's remarkable, the, uh, the separation, spatial separation of uh, justice in this context. So we're interested in social issues, in new ways of representing the world, ourselves, journalism, and knowledge. So whilst John is, uh, uh, oh, we, we've we're still on that. So yeah, we're kind of good, we need to go beyond that. Yeah. You, you, you are doing data journalism. Uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, by this time uh, doing other journalism. I think we go to the next slide. Okay. We, are, we move you know, on. We're kind of uh, s slithering into uh, uh, the. Um, uh, uh, th this was my last job uh, in professional journalism uh, of a kind of full-time job, job, job. Uh, I was editor of the New Statesman. I was editor of the New Statesman in the period uh, uh, before uh, Blair formed his first government in 1997, uh, and uh, I was then editor uh, 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 for a period afterwards. Uh, this was uh, the edition of the magazine uh, the week that, uh, Blair, uh, that Blair won, uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I uh, uh, wrote an editorial uh, saying that uh, Blair um, could be uh, Britain's greatest prime minister since uh, Winston Churchill. Um, then, a couple of months later, <laughs> uh, w uh, w we were we were Shines here, um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, so so the, the New Statesman was um, uh, was the most political job I did in journalism. You know, by that time, I'd edited The Independent, I'd deputy edited the FT, I'd been director of BBC News. Uh, and I think the kind of, uh, the thing that's going on in my beating heart uh, uh, in that time uh, is somehow or other being suspicious of the power uh, I am wielding uh, and the power and the setup that is around me and my uh, instinctive um, uh, uh, distrust of high priesthoods uh, uh, limits my ability to appreciate uh, the people who've given me very good jobs. So this sequence is actually about making a choice and starting a career <laughs> and allowing within that choice other alternatives nevertheless to, as it were, ferment. And this is what happened to me. I became a professional academic. I found out that I knew how to write books. Uh, I, uh, I was, uh, what's the word, um, cursed, damned, doomed by my PhD supervisor who said, you're only as good as your last book. Um, <laughs> so I had to uh, produce one every year from that day onwards, which I have. And um, here are some of them from that period, which uh, are not meant to be a cue <coughs> to, you know, uh, going through the various arguments. But I do want to point out that I'm trying to combine an understanding of journalism from the point of view of its readers, audiences, and citizens at large with an understanding of popular culture in its most entertaining mode and to try and understand how those two things intersect uh, in a very long series of books over a very long period going there from 1978 through to 2012 uh, with lots of other things in between too. Um, but it's, it seems to me that there's a professionalization of uh, capabilities and skills that are nevertheless committed to uh, some uh, values that have uh, um, some of the communitarian or, uh, or uh, political agendas still in place. Okay, so um, I mean, uh, th there's the summary of it. Uh, and you know, we're, uh, we're getting uh, quite close to the earth-shattering moment <laughs> when John and I meet. Um, Shall I uh, move to that point? Because... Uh, uh, I'm doing this, and you know, things happen. You know, as with all of us, uh, things happen in your personal life that uh, shape what you do uh, in your work life and your public life. I in my case, uh, we had we had children, and uh, uh, I didn't want to live in central London anymore. Uh, uh, and uh, by coincidence, the, the phone rang, and somebody said, "Would you like to run 
uh, the journalism uh, operation at Cardiff, or the vocational journalism operation at Cardiff. And that was how I met John Hartley. <coughs> Here. <laughs> Indeed there. Yeah, no, we both lived here. I live here now. Uh, I live here now, and this is, a, this is a creative citizenship project, if ever there was one. That's Penarth Pier. It was a ruin until about a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, so I live somewhere kind of back behind those trees. Where did you, you lived kind of over there, didn't you? I lived in uh, a part of Penarth that was uh, my, my former supervisor, the one who told me to keep writing books, advised me not to live in because it's where the, the um, working class social housing was located rather than the middle class uh, villas. <laughs> Uh, but luckily, they've demolished the social housing, and my uh, house is therefore much more valuable. But all this happened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all, thi all this happened, unfortunately, after I left for Australia, so I, di <laughs> I didn't get the benefit of it. But, uh, but crucially, John, uh, we, we haven't really done these slides very well. Uh, but, uh, crucially, you had uh, rather kindly set up the School of Journalism, Media, had, and Cultural yes. Studies at Cardiff University, without which. Yeah, there wouldn't have been anywhere to make a phone call about to ask me if I would like to go and work there. So why yeah. did you do that? Yes, it's not about uh, Penarth. It's really about Cardiff and the School of Journalism. Uh, and uh, I, I was extremely proud and privileged to be able to take the, uh, the s what was then a section of the English school into uh, independence, as it were, uh, since today is the day we're talking about such things, uh, as a separate school uh, in 1996, I think it was. Uh, um, w which took some c it took some convincing of the university. The university was worried that applied skills and uh, professional training were not really what a Russell Group university should be doing. So we had to demonstrate that we were across the uh, scholarly and uh, academic um, requirements, as, uh, as well as pulling in enough students, enough grants, and enough, uh, as it were, attention uh, to justify the expense. And also, I had to halve the debt. Uh, which uh, the school had inherited before it even was a school. So this was all to do with managerial change of an institution that was trying to pull itself up by its bootstraps from about 60th on the then rankings to where it eventually reached under the very wise uh, vice-chancellorship of Sir Brian Smith uh, to about 7th uh, in about 10 years. So it was a place on the move, it wanted to do new things, it was willing to take a risk and trust people to do them, and it trusted me to go ahead with journalism. And uh, I knew that I wouldn't be accepted by journalism professionals as an educator, so we had to get someone who knew what they were talking about in, and that someone was Ian. What's the next picture? Oh, but, yeah. but yeah, yes, yeah. but yeah. in the belly of the beast, there was something going on that was rather different. Do you want to tell the story, or shall I? Well, let me just say something before you, te <coughs> you tell the story. But uh, So we're, yeah, we're around the turn of the millennium here. We're, we're, we're sitting at around 1999. 2000, and uh, uh, so I pitch up, uh, you know, as a journalist who's, I don't, know, I don't think I'd walked into a university since I'd been an undergraduate, uh, uh, but I was uh, in charge of uh, an operation which was um, uh, training, uh, training young people, uh, uh, educating young people in the way of uh, becoming uh, journalists. Uh, the people on the course uh, when I arrived uh, were using mechanical typewriters uh, in 1999. Uh, uh, even though uh, historians of the internet will know uh, that was a little bit out of date by then. So we sent all the typewriters to Cardiff Jail, where they were valued by the prisoners, uh, and uh, introduced, uh, after a fight, there was always a fight, um, uh, uh, newer technology. Uh, and um, uh, I uh, engaged in the business of uh, trying to help move the journalism, journalism part of the journalism school into the emerging internet age. That's what I was doing. Kay. Meanwhile, John was doing cultural studies. <laughs> uh, and other things. One of the things I was doing was reducing debt. And it was quite clear that training people in postgraduate courses in photojournalism was not going to last very long, because uh, newspapers had stopped uh, hiring picture editors and didn't run their own uh, photo desks. They bought in pictures from um, agencies and paparazzi and whatnot. So it was quite clear that the training of professional journalism um, photographers uh, was, um, uh, uh, was uh, in jeopardy. And the person who was doing that was Daniel Meadows, a very well-known British documentary photographer, who himself, as a photographer, not as a, not as a journalism trainer, 
had a had a, a fascinating history in seeking to record, represent, and communicate uh, uh, ordinary people's lives in industrial Britain. Um, uh, one example of which was him when he left university in the 1970s. You can see there, uh, uh, the head by the hair. Uh, he's of our generation. Uh, he bought himself a double-decker bus, turned half of it into a uh, dark room, uh, drove around Britain um, uh, in the bus and uh, collared people on the street, uh, uh, particularly ordinary people, and said, can I take your photograph? And the results, as you see, are like those on the left. Twenty-something years later, while at Cardiff, he dug out the negs of this, uh, of this project and decided to go and find all these people again and retake their photographs 20 to 25 years later a project which came to be called Photobus, and uh, it's a publication you can still um, uh, get hold of. So his commitment to, uh, as it were, self-representation of ordinariness among the British was uh, very well known. But at that stage, and I think owing to um, Ian's good graces, uh, uh, it, Daniel discovered a new technology means to do similar work, uh, which yeah, no, no, I, no, I, I played no part in Daniel discovering digital storytelling. He went to America. Uh, somebody, I think, invited him to America. Uh, and he came back and said, you've got to see this. Uh, and there was um, a website uh, 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 run by a guy called Dana Winslow Hley III. <laughs> um, uh, and it had uh, a series of digital stories on it, you know, st still images, a little bit of music uh, and talk over it. Uh, and it was very captivating. And Daniel was by then off. Daniel basically introduced digital storytelling to Europe yes. uh, uh, and arguably to Australia. Yes, uh, he did both of those things and also to the BBC, which was quite a feat. Yes, there was a big series, Capture Wales. Uh, and uh, and Dan this was the kind of thing Daniel said uh, you know, then. Uh, you can hear him saying it now. Uh, I did invite him to come today, but he's not been very well uh, lately, uh, and uh, so he's not here. But this is pure Daniel. Uh, as a digital storyteller, you can step through the screen for too long. <laughs> he would wave his, his for too long. The professionals have had it their own way, feeding us a kind of TV in which we're only represented by the labels they stick on us. <laughs> Yeah. Digital storytelling allows us to reassert our individuality in the wired world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so uh, what Daniel Meadows represents for both Ian and I is the effort to bring <coughs> professional practice and creative practice together with the studies element of journalism and new media uh, in order to try something new through uh, digital storytelling, which was... Which was um, uh, as it were, a protected species inside uh, 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 the uh, School of Journalism and uh, found uh, uh, its justification in the fact that the BBC took it up. So it became a, f a kind of self-representation but nevertheless professional kind of practice. Mm. Uh, a unique set of circumstances, which is, I think, telling part of the story of what brings us together. Yeah, so I can't remember where we go now. Let's see. Uh, the next one is Wild Geese. So okay, oh, Wild Geese. Oh, well, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe before we go to Wild Geese, uh, uh, we sh uh, should mention the fact that uh, you know, by, by this time I'm pretty much fancying myself as an expert on uh, uh, you know, talking about journalism in the way that only people who've left something uh, you know, can uh, command that sense of expertise. Uh, and I remember I wrote a book um, which John encouraged me to write. If you're in a university, you have to write books. Uh, and uh, th this book got turned into another book and uh, I just actually, this summer, it uh, the new edition of it was published. But I remember writing in it words to the effect that, um, you know, thanking various people, uh, but particularly thanking John. Um, uh, because uh, I felt uh, that J John had, uh, uh, although his work was incomprehensible <laughs> to me, uh, 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 you know, in any serious way, I could read it and understand the words, but I didn't really understand uh, what John and indeed other colleagues uh, in the school were really doing. Uh, I had a very, very sure instinct that uh, it would be a good idea to try to understand it and to pay attention to it. Uh, and I was very, very irritated. I'd always been irritated by the tendency of professional journalists 
not to want to listen to people who weren't professional journalists. They say, oh, no, we are holding power to account. You know, we are uh, uh, the people who um, you know, will kind of you know, stand for you, the people. Uh, and I'd always been uncomfortable with that idea. I think I got my kind of uh, uh, my birth of, uh, of uh, feeling about that was when I worked for the Keithley News, a weekly <laughs> newspaper in Yorkshire. Uh, and I wrote something about somebody, I can't remember what the story even was, but I do remember, because you know, the Keith News in those days was in a shop on the high street, I remember being uh, told that somebody wanted to see me down in the shop, uh, and I went down to see him, and he punched me on the nose, <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, he felt that I, I had not, um, you know, uh, correctly dealt with uh, the story in which uh, he and his family had been referred to. Uh, and... Um, that uh, fortified the instinct that journalism uh, needs to be open. Uh, of course it needs professionalism, it needs you know, to do it very, very well, the skills are complex and need to be practiced and you know, all that, all of that is true, but if it's accompanied by a wall of arrogance, uh, then uh, it won't work and I think that you know, what Daniel is saying here uh, was what uh, struck a chord with me and what I have felt right through you know, the history of journalism from then till now up to and including the Leveson report, the phone hacking affair and so on, uh, where in this period we've had the technology also collide into those issues uh, in a way that put me naturally on the side of maybe the technology will help us as well. And being a historian of media, uh, what motivated me, among uh, other things, was uh, the knowledge that journalism is not an artefact of its professionalization. Journalism is obviously much older than that, and the people who I admired were the people who, <coughs> who took up the pen and wrote uh, uh, with no uh, uh, sense of, uh, of um, uh, joining a profession. People like John Milton, for example. And so um, uh, I've always thought of journalism as being part of citizenship, about citizenship, and for it. Uh, and I've always thought of journalism as what I've called in one of my papers a human right. Everybody has the right to communicate uh, using whatever means are available to them. Uh, and, uh, and this obviously doesn't sit well with professional journalism uh, as, a, as a kind of industry uh, a skill, uh, but uh, it does seem to me to speak directly to uh, various uh, concepts of citizenship, and that's what we tried to put together in Wales. Uh, but... Uh, once, once you have uh, tasted uh, freedom uh, from um, the idea of a profession and a kind of fixed set of destinations, it becomes a little tempting uh, to uh, think, oh, well, maybe I can have a look at that and have a look at that uh, and you know, have a go at that and have a go at that. And this is, uh, this is the wild geese years, a uh, bit of Yates up there, not, I'm not comparing myself with... Irish Republicans or, uh, or indeed with anybody. Uh, but uh, I, I never quite left the university, but I, I confirmed the ambiguity of my status with regard to the university uh, by um, uh, going off and doing uh, a couple of other jobs. I, I worked in business. I worked for a, a company which didn't go down well with some of the other people that I knew. Um, uh, and, uh, and then I worked for uh, the Wright Milliband. Uh, <laughs> the Wright um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, At the Foreign Office. Uh, but I was not there on the day that he found himself facing the cameras with a banana in his hand. <laughs> oh, my God! How did that happen? Uh, um, but that's what, that, that's, that's what I did. And, uh, but I, I knew uh, you know, the deal with David was that uh, I, would, I would do this until the general election, which we knew would be probably in May 2010, as it was. Uh, and uh, I never had any intention of becoming a civil servant long term or a political advisor long term. But I was interested, very interested in all this. Very interesting. I'll tell you more about it over a coffee. But uh, that's, that, that was what, you know, I think I'm the wild geese, the wild goose up the top. Meanwhile, wild goose Hartley, look at this. Uh, my form of restlessness was twofold. I went back to Australia, uh, and uh, I, I took the path to the dark side, uh, where I became an academic uh, executive. 
and uh, it was my uh, pleasure actually to found a new faculty called Creative Industries at QUT and build a new precinct for it and that is said precinct. So this is uh, an attempt to shape institutions as well as to contribute to the spread of knowledge and uh, I regard it as part of restlessness because I really wanted to find ways to bring the agenda that had always motivated me into a much wider purview than was possible simply by uh, producing yet more books. Uh, and so uh, this is one uh, experiment of, of that kind. Yeah, so, oh, well, this is uh, John with his family. Yes, I, uh, the reason why that's up on the uh, slide is because that photograph was taken in Australia at a farm uh, which I, I hesitate to uh, uh, admit I, I bought. And um, the photograph was taken by Daniel Meadows when he came and visited. Uh, so uh, it does link all these things up in a rather personal way. Uh, but, uh, uh, of course, it also took Ian and I very far apart, and we didn't meet for quite some time. No, we didn't. We didn't uh, at all. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, rather, I mean, so wild a goose was I that even whilst I was wild goosing it uh, with David Miliband, uh, 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 at the same time I was writing a review of the future of creative industries for the Welsh government. Um, uh, and uh, I started to get interested in, uh, in that. And then, uh, you know, to make this short, um, uh, that uh, I left uh, the uh, I left the political uh, world at that general election, uh, and I uh, was asked uh, by Cardiff University to uh, uh, dream up some job. Uh, so I dreamt up the job of being professor of digital economy, uh, and uh, and <coughs> no sooner had I dreamt it up and sat down uh, than I got a call. Uh, from uh, the other government, the London one, uh, asking me if I'd do this piece of work on intellectual property, uh, which um, uh, has led to uh, a very, very uh, 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 difficult uh, period of political negotiation, not by me, but the recommendations of that are now uh, in law. Uh, that happened, the last, well, the last significant bit of that happened at the end of July. Uh, and I uh, did this work, there was a quotation from it in one of the workshops this morning, with Nesta, which build on that, built on that, which was to talk about uh, the wider concept of the creative economy within which the creative industries sit, uh, but to think about the place of creativity in the economy uh, more broadly. And it was, uh, you know, th those things hadn't happened when I also, because I'm now an academic, uh, I am told by my director of research, no, my, by my head of school, uh, why don't you go and try and get some money? Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, a, an event uh, going on, um, you know, uh, would you go to it? So I went to it. Where's the event? Is there an event next? It's, com it's coming in one, but one slide, okay. uh, because the first one is uh, oh, yeah. my, my landmark book, published in 2009, uh, which is a landmark for both of us and also perhaps uh, more widely because it looks back to the work of Richard Hoggart, who is the first uh, critic, not necessarily theorist, to take popular culture seriously in relation to its mediation and the spread of knowledge uh, and forward to the new digital environment that uh, we've been talking about for the last two days. So uh, my agendas and Ian's were converging uh, uh, quite interestingly at exactly the same time and then uh, uh, we went uh, we, we found ourselves at the same event yeah that's the weird thing uh, uh, that, that is the serendipitous bit of this I, I don't think you and I had spoken probably for I don't know uh, five or six years perhaps could be um, uh, uh, until suddenly we find ourselves in Birmingham at an event that probably some other people in this room in fact I know a number of other people uh, in the room were at it uh, and this was, uh, you know, sand, play, uh, meet new people, uh, think new thoughts, find out who's kind of doing something that's relevant to you and if your stuff is relevant to them. And then I look across the room and who's there but Hartley uh, sitting there, you know, as an expert brought in by the AHRC from Australia to, you know, provoke, he help, us, help us, you know, find the truth or something like that. What were you yeah. doing there? Uh, I was provoking, uh, and uh, 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 what it uh, what attracted me was the fact that the AHRC wanted, in the context of this connected communities program, uh, to develop uh, 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 research around the concept of the creative industries. And uh, uh, as you can see, this was one of the, this is their slide, not ours. 
uh, this is the kind of thing they were looking for. And I think that's a, a, a good question. I thought the Research Council should move on to uh, this uh, way of uh, dispersing uh, money that's uh, devoted to humanities research. So I was very glad to come along and uh, add my Tupmsworth to the, as it were, conceptualization of what, might, of what bids might come in. And uh, same thing here. I was astonished to see Ian sitting across the room. And so uh, at that point, our agendas uh, coincided. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, uh, making what was itself a very long story, uh, 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 very short, um, we started to talk and meet the, uh, the group of researchers who were in this room, uh, 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 met and you know, the, the process, in the process the bid emerged and uh, this question emerged as our uh, preoccupying research question. Uh, and uh, John uh, kindly agreed to um, uh, continue to work with us. Uh, I think, what did we call you? International Mentor or something like that? That was anyway. one of the names. There yeah. were others. You yeah. can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, w we, were, we were hungry uh, for uh, inspiration and uh, definition and boundary, but we also wanted the road to be open. Uh, it's that kind of question. I mean, it raises uh, a lot of other questions. So for me, the oh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, I, we can uh, move into a more general uh, discussion now. But for me, the motivation for being involved in this project is not only the value of the project itself, which is really carried by the uh, um, investigators here in Britain, but also uh, what it says about the state of knowledge. So uh, I, I hope that what I've... Um, uh, learnt and contributed to the process is that the uh, study of creativity and of citizenship is not behavioural, uh, it's not uh, simply personal <laughs> anecdote, although personal stories do come into these things very strongly, uh, nor is it simply a narrativization of either politics or research. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's important to hold on to all of those apparent contradictions and try and pull them together into some new kind of conceptualization of uh, uh, creativity and citizenship and in my view uh, what that uh, produces uh, is not uh, you know poor s uh, social science methodology but uh, new ways of producing knowledge so I see this project very much as a innovative knowledge producing machine uh, and uh, uh, I think this um, event is is demonstrating that that is the case it's a very varied group of people here with very varied uh, agendas uh, and uh, multidisciplinary to the point of not being disciplined at all. Um, and so we need to learn how to talk to each other across these boundaries to accommodate the clashes of different knowledge systems, different value systems and so on, and to find new ways to collaborate towards uh, some innovation in ideas and practices. So that's really where I'm hoping for myself that this, um, this little series has, has, has taken us. Uh, because I think the, uh, there is a role for academics, there is a role for formal knowledge systems, uh, and there is a role for, uh, you know, quite um, uh, um, disciplined, uh, popperian uh, uh, approaches to the, the um, uh, study of these things. Uh, but they need to be in touch with uh, where people are coming from, uh, how they know things, and, um, uh, uh, and how they produce their own identities in these kinds of circumstances. So the, the, the message for me is that we, we live in a world where complex systems, as um, uh, Paolo was telling us the other day, uh, where complex systems really do uh, determine uh, our positions, our agency and our identities in some ways, and yet those complex systems are productive uh, for everybody in the system, not just for trained elites or professionals. So the, uh, the, the, the lesson is more about uh, how to sample, to understand, to characterize the productivity in creative terms and in civic terms of the whole population and not just of trained elites that makes this kind of work really uh, challenging and interesting for me. So, uh, uh, but the challenges uh, include, uh, well, the, the inspirations include, I mean, you know, my concerns, if you like, uh, to use a rather academic word, um, uh, you know, right through all of the work that I've done in all the different things that I've done have been concerned with, um, uh, with political issues, uh, with community issues, uh, with, um, if you like, uh, the, the self-actualizing end of creative 
that end of creativity. Uh, and um, I thought that, the, that where we, well, that's why I very much wanted, it wasn't only me obviously who wanted it, that's why I very much wanted to have the political uh, people here to uh, tell us how they uh, see it. Um, uh, and I, what, it, what has emerged from this um, event for me uh, is uh, a, a really powerful set of insights into uh, the importance of um, thinking about the right way to make partnerships. Uh, if you, uh, y you can't do uh, any of this uh, on your own. Uh, but we all know, because I no, no doubt we've all been guilty of it, I certainly have, uh, forming partnerships in the wrong way uh, where uh, they're, they're not authentic or honest or um, as equal as they can be uh, or uh, open uh, and listening um, is, uh, is also not, not going to work. Um, and when I... Um, taking part in various discussions in the last two days about universities. Um, uh, for me, I'm just delighted uh, to see uh, universities uh, in trouble, <laughs> uh, just as I was delighted to see journalism in trouble. Because uh, it's only when you get into trouble that you really start to think uh, about what it is uh, that uh, you're there to do. And you know, universities aren't in that much trouble, uh, and journalism perhaps in a bit more. Um, uh, but um, uh, being uh, one of the ways that you can move <coughs> your thinking on and do things that are capable of landing uh, and achieving something, achieving some difference, to use the jargon, to make a difference, uh, I think you've only really got a good chance of doing that uh, if you have uh, understood with whom you are collaborating and why, uh, and you know, all of the circumstances that attend that. Uh, two and a half years ago, I knew nothing about uh, that applied to design. So it's been a thrilling journey for me to understand, uh, you know, to go from the first conversations that uh, took place with Catherine. Where, where's Catherine? Yeah, there, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, through to you know, this event uh, uh, and listening to... Uh, the <coughs> remarkable Paolo Antonelli and so on. Um, uh, and that's true, uh, you know, in uh, multiple dimensions of this. Uh, and um, <coughs> the... Uh, when uh, John Dovey... Uh, um, when I, I started to understand how John... Is John here? He just popped out. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, Time to write. ...was kind of thinking about organising this. Um, uh, I kind of thought, well, um, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll trust that. He's, he knows what he's doing. Uh, and um, I have found the, uh, the routes through people's different stories and their questions and their challenges. Uh, I think the answer, James, to your question in the, uh, uh, in the panel this morning, or to you made a number of questions, but the, the one that uh, made me think most was, uh, d does... The, the creative citizenship idea, uh, as it were, uh, take you away from politics because it becomes a kind of, you know, social media obsessed um, uh, part of the filter bubble. It's a kind of, you know, it's a phenomenon of the filter bubble, and uh, and it and you know that's clearly a risk. Uh, but uh, what I think we found in our uh, work on the ground is that. Uh, uh, as uh, Paula again uh, uh, referred to it, we are living uh, in a n uh, nearly post-digital world. Uh, and uh, none of the stories that I've heard here in the last 48 hours uh, are, uh, bear any resemblance to the glad, confident morning of uh, what Jean called uh, uh, the Web 2.0 moment. Uh, we are, we're now in a different phase of this, uh, a more grown-up phase, and it has to be capable of um, engaging with and changing politics uh, as well as engaging with and changing academia and universities. Uh, 
Uh, and I think that the creativity of our citizenship is about that. Uh, and that is, I think, why I'm on this track uh, at the moment and why I'm uh, pretty optimistic that something will land out of it, even though, you know, uh, I, uh, I hear what uh, the political class says, uh, you know, uh, if it doesn't um, appeal to, you know, a snappy short-term agenda uh, for a serving politician, you're not going to, you know, it's not going to be in the manifesto. It doesn't need to be in the manifesto, uh, but uh, it does need to be uh, honest, uh, well-rooted in communities, uh, and, uh, and I think if you get that, it'll be okay. Right, we're being told to shut up, Are we? um, uh, uh, which I guess we should. Uh, we've deferred the, the questions uh, uh, by default, I think, to the uh, wrap-up session later on. Uh, but I just want to add one small thing before we do finish, and that is that uh, there are some practical outcomes from this kind of work. Uh, they have to do with uh, the, producer, the production of not just knowledge, but innovation. Where do new ideas come from and how can they be implemented? And I think we do have some guidance on that from some of the speakers at this, uh, at this uh, conference, including Jeff Mulgan early on, where rapid prototyping and experimentation becomes the name of the game, where people work together in teams across disciplinary and sectoral boundaries uh, for a particular purpose. So as Charlie Ledbetter calls it, creative communities with a purpose are sources of innovation, new ideas and change in fast-moving and technologically equipped societies. And it's that that makes uh, what we're doing here important. It's not simply that we're doing good work with our community partners. It is that as a whole, w that, uh, that kind of uh, system of good works with community partners across discipline boundaries uh, is going to produce new ideas, some of which will be taken up, some of which won't. Uh, uh, but uh, they are the kind of engine of newness uh, that will help uh, our civic system to reproduce itself perhaps a little more successfully than it's currently doing. So if you can, co if you can uh, join, us, uh, join the whole research team again for the final session after the next set of workshops, um, uh, that's where we hope we will um, uh, get this um, uh, final gathering of, um, uh, of points and mood and insights. Uh, and we'd be very uh, glad to see you then. Uh, meanwhile, um, the workshops are waiting to be formed.